a moment. There we go. Well, thanks for joining this uh, this installment of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Uh, my name is Travis Steffens. I'm uh, currently in Toronto, Ontario, so that's uh, up in Canada. I'm the founder and director of Planet Madagascar, and I've been working with uh, Joe, who started Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants for a few months now. He's been helping my organization um, raise money and, uh, and do um, work in Madagascar. So, um, I just want to make sure that you can all hear me. So, if you can hear me fine, um, everyone give another wave on both classes there. Wonderful. Okay. Well, we're joined here by Mr. Cameron's class up in North Bay, Ontario. Or, sorry, Thunder Bay, I believe. Um, and we also have um, Mr. Sackett and Mrs. Wazneski's class in Catalyst Charter Middle School in Wisconsin. So, this is great. We've got an international group here covering two-thirds of North America. All right, well, I'm going to share my screen, so hopefully this will work, because I want to share with you a little bit of a slideshow on Madagascar, and then I can give you a little um, uh, talk about, about this amazing place. There we go. Okay, so big, uh, big wave again. If you can now see a picture of a lemur, wonderful. <laughs> Great. So I'm going to talk today um, a little bit about... Uh, myself uh, and the work that I do in Madagascar. Um, okay. I won't be able to see you guys, so let me try something different here. I have to push another button. Give me one moment. I want to share this. Great. We'll do we'll do it this way. Okay. I'm assuming you guys all see it. If anyone doesn't see it, you can um, you can uh, you can shout out because I can hear um, Mr. Cameron's class. So uh, we are um, going to talk today about Madagascar. Just to introduce myself. I'm the founding director of Planet Madagascar, um, and I work uh, also with the IUCN Species Specialist Group, helping to decide sort of this status of lemurs in Madagascar. I'm a fellow of the Explorers Club, PhD candidate here at the University of Toronto, um, but I'm also a trip leader, so I take people to different countries to show them wildlife and culture from around the world, and I mostly focus on southern Africa and uh, Madagascar, uh, but I've taken people to Russia, Central America, different parts of Canada. Um, and today's talk, we're going to take a little journey to Madagascar, we're going to learn about the diversity of the landscape and about an expedition I did um, almost a year ago now to a place called the Singi with the, uh, with the Explorers Club and an organization called Adventure Science. We're going to learn a bit about the diversity of animals in Madagascar because there's some incredible stuff in that country. Then I'm going to talk about some of the conservation issues plaguing lemurs in Madagascar and what is being done to help lemurs in Madagascar through my organization. So hopefully this shows up well because there's a little video here of flying from Toronto where I am. We would go all the way around the other side of the world. So that means all the way over Africa, the southeast corner of the African continent, to Madagascar. Travis, are you so Madag Yeah. Are you sharing uh, a video right now? Yeah, it's just a screen uh, share. Do you guys see? Would you see the globe? No, no, we just still see you. Okay, let me see if I can fix that. How about the um, the guys in Wisconsin there? Did you guys see the globe? You can wave if you did. No? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. Oh, no. See if we can make this work. I had this working earlier, so should be this one. Start the share. No, I need it, but we still have a lot of there we go. How's that? Does everyone see? Um, great. <laughs> well, let's go back on this journey. Let's go. Let's make sure you can see it proper here. I should um, play it. Okay, I'm going to play it now, and you tell me if you're seeing us journeying from Toronto to Madagascar. You know what, Travis? I think the problem is, and I, I noticed this on another Hangout, is when you go to play, uh, I you're able to share. So if you almost go slide by slide, 
Do you guys can see the slide then now? No. no. Okay, let me try it again. I think I know that happened on a on a different talk I was doing before as well. So let's read screen share. Everyone will wave once they see that screen. There we have it. Okay. Yeah. Yay, okay. <laughs> Great. Okay, I'm gonna play it. I'm gonna see if you guys can all see that. So let's replay it. Back to here. You're seeing a journey from Toronto to Madagascar? Absolutely. Yeah, okay, great. So it's, it's the video is a little slow, and hopefully the next video will work out fine. If not, then I, I will just show the, the photos that I have. Um, so great, so now here we are. We're at uh, Madagascar, beautiful beaches, one of the nicest and most beautiful beaches in the world. Um, it has um, thousands and thousands of kilometers of coastline. It's the fourth largest island in the world. So it's massive. So if you're in Canada, that's about the size of Alberta. If you're in the U.S., that's about the size of Texas. It's an island the size of Texas. Um, if you're in Europe, this would be an island the size of France. It's a massive place. Beautiful beaches, um, amazing rainforest. We have some a lot of cloud forest there. Uh, this is a cloud forest in the eastern part of the country. I'm just going to try to make this a bit bigger. Um, you have tropical dry forests. These are similar to our deciduous forests here in North America, where ours will lose their leaves during the winter. Well, there they lose their leaves in our summer, their winter, um, because it's too dry. And so they will, in the western part of the country, it's very dry, so they'll lose their leaves during the, the long dry season. And then they have an amazing, um, a amazing um, forest called the spiny dry forest. This occurs in the southwest part of the country, where the trees are all filled with spines, and they have weaponry designed to protect themselves from being eaten by other um, other plants and animals. Of course, if you've ever been to Africa or seen pictures, you might have seen pictures of baobab trees. Lots of baobabs in Madagascar. Actually, most baobab species are from Madagascar. In fact, all of them are from Madagascar. Even the ones that are in Africa and Australia originally came from Madagascar. I mentioned the expedition that I did in in um, in Madagascar earlier this year, or it actually was it was almost a year ago now. There's a place called the Singi. Now I don't know how well you see that, but this is a limestone forest in Madagascar that used to be an ancient coral reef. So millions and millions of years ago, there was a great barrier reef off of Madagascar, a lot like there's one off of Belize and another one off. Of uh, northern Australia. This barrier reef would have been underwater and um, over time as the land mass of Madagascar um, formed and, and came out of the ocean um, and split from, from other parts of Africa, this uh, lagoon that used to contain uh, the, 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 um, the um, coral reef um, became exposed. And you ended up with this strange formation, what they call Singi Madagascar. That's T S I N G Y. And Singi means a place where you cannot walk barefoot. And so you have there um, spires of limestone that are between 10 to 30 meters high. So that would be between 30 and 100 feet high. Um, very, very massive um, spires. And they're razor sharp. We went on an expedition there earlier, um, I guess it was October last year, with Men's Journal and Discovery Channel to see if we could be the first people to cross Singi in the area we were going. So I was part of, I was asked to be part of the expedition as one of the leaders. I'm uh, an expert in Madagascar, so they brought me in as the Madagascar person. They sent me ahead of the team, and I had to travel over three days to get to this area from the capital of Madagascar. Now it takes almost two days to fly to Madagascar. So after flying to Madagascar, I then drove for three days over land using land rovers like this on dirt roads and traveled as far as we could go to the the closest town nearby the Singi. When I arrived there with my, uh, I had a small team with me, we got motorcycles and we went off into the bush looking for um, an area we could set up our base camp. So we had to go even further in. So this is now four days into the most remote part of Madagascar. When we got to where we wanted to go, 
we realized that there's no way we were going to be able to get the equipment in. It was going to be too difficult unless we decided the only way to do it would be to build a road. And so, fortunately, we had some fantastic drivers and we had some fantastic um, um, uh, trucks with us. And we hired some villagers and they would come out and uh, they would help us build roads across creeks uh, through little drainages. And I'll show you a video a little bit later about how we ended up getting all of our equipment, supplies, and the rest of the team in. Well, I was um, there early on, and I, I met with uh, two other colleagues who flew in. So after I established the base camp, two other colleagues flew in, and uh, we decided to do a reconnaissance. So just to give you a sense how remote this is, we now spent four days driving across land, and we're going to do a reconnaissance to go and see if we can cross the Singhi. Now, the mission for us to go there wasn't just to see the Singhi. We knew inside the city there was going to be some really cool stuff. One was going to be lemurs. That's why I was there. I wanted to go find lemurs. The other was there would be uh, massive cave systems that were undiscovered. So we're looking to find large cave systems. We also wanted to find evidence of, um, of ancient people that used to live in the area. Sorry, just got a message from Joe. Can everyone see me again still? They're still seeing these photos? Good. Yeah, so we, great. Fantastic. And so um, so we're walking, what do we we're walking into the forest now. Everyone see that with a wave? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Thank you. Um, and so we wanted to find evidence of ancient cultures, and we also wanted to find um, uh, dinosaur footprints. Surprisingly, um, on this part of Madagascar, because there was an ancient lagoon that used to hold the uh, barrier reef, there would have been a beach. And on that beach, there would hopefully be remnant um, dinosaur footprints. And, and um, one of the neat things is that in this area, we, uh, if we found the dinosaur footprints in this spot, we would know there, there was evidence of... Um, a dinosaur migration route going from south to north. We knew of dinosaur footprints in the south, but if we could prove that there are dinosaur footprints here, we'd know of a dinosaur migration route, which are actually quite rare. This is what it's like to uh, walk on the Singhi. This is the razor sharp tips of the Singhi. My second step that I took on the Singhi um, with my boot, it cut a, uh, cut a hole right through my rubber sole, right into my sock. So it's extremely sharp. We're having a difficult time walking on top of this, and you'll see in the video later um, how hard it would be to move through this area. We decided maybe we should descend down inside the Singhi to find different cracks that might get us to where we wanted to go. So as we're going through there, we found that it was getting harder and harder and harder. We meant to only be out uh, for about six hours, um, so we'd have enough time to return back to our base camp before dark. Um, we brought enough food for, for a day and a half. We had enough water for the day. And we knew there was lots of water in the Singhi because we had spent all day um, walking through water to get there. Um, but what we didn't realize is that the Singhi actually had a peak. You can't see it on satellite images. It's covered in forest. But on one side to the east where we were walking towards, there was no water. And so this became a problem. And as we were walking along uh, on top of the Singhi, just like you saw here, we made a decision. We decided that there would be no way for us to reach back to camp before dark, so we decided to push forward. This turned out to be um, a bit of a problem, because the Singhi ended up being a lot harder to cross than we expect. And after spending a night there, we ran out of water. So I'm going to play a short little video for you, and I want you guys to um, wave to me if you see it once it starts playing. I want to make sure you hear it as well. This is Simon. He's one of the expedition leaders with me, guys. describing the, the predicament that we're in. Well, here we are morning of day two, and we had an unexpected night uh, camping with no supplies. Um, our biggest concern, though, was uh, running low on water, and we were basically out of water. We spent the uh, past few morning hours uh, literally licking the dew off leaves. Uh, we pulled water out of tree well. We just filled all of our bladders and water bottles with water that's preserved in these little uh, limestone kettles. They're almost like mini ponds. They're full of tadpoles, 
and there's a bunch of zebu that have been grazing here. Evidence is everywhere, so we know that the water is contaminated. It's a risk we have to take. We treated it with chlorine pills. We've been extra uh, diligent and added more chlorine than recommended. So hopefully that keeps us from getting sick, but having some kind of water keeps us from getting bad. So that was Simon, and um, yeah, it was a bit. It was a bit hard. We realized at that point we might not have a lot of water, and this is what the color of the water was that we had to drink. It didn't look good. This water was filled with. Um, he said he mentioned zebu. Zebu is a type of cattle, so it was, it was filled with cattle droppings, um, lots of different tadpoles. So we took our T-shirts. We we filtered the water so that there'd be no tadpoles or dung. Um, but it didn't smell good and it didn't taste good. We had we had chlorine, as Simon mentioned, so we treated the water, um, but this ended up being a problem. The water treatment we put in, we put in too much. Because the water was so dirty, we put in extra. And for one of us, that became a real issue. For, for the other one, uh, Jim, he was having a hard time dealing with all the chlorine. And so he was getting very sick from the chlorine, and we had to push on. We know he still had two more days to get back to camp if we were going to finish crossing the Singhi, and then find a route out. Now the problem was we weren't lost, we knew where we were, we had now found water. The biggest problem was going back over to the, um, the, the camp where we were. We'd have to cross back over the same Singhi that I showed you a picture of before. And this would have been dangerous. So we made a decision, we made a camp, and we made a decision that we were going to have to hire a helicopter to come get us. Now. That's not easy in Madagascar. We had rescue insurance, but it turns out that the rescue insurance, they don't know how to come get you in Madagascar. And so, fortunately, someone worked for a member of the Canadian government in our, in our team. So we had our sat phone and our cell phones and our radios, and we were talking to our base camp team who had, who had arrived while we were sleeping overnight. Um, and they phoned the Canadian government. The Canadian government called the Madagascar government, and they got a military helicopter to come get us. Well, we were excited by this. It was another day after we had started doing this before the helicopter come, came. And we're now three days in, and we've only been eating peanuts um, and drinking water that didn't taste very good. Um, well, when the helicopter came, it actually came, flew right over our camp that we built and off into the distance. And on my last little bit of cell phone battery, I phoned um, the person organizing the logistics. And I said, please, 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 just tell the helicopter to turn around. Um, the thing is, they thought we were inside one of the cracks of the Singhi. They didn't expect us to be on the other side because no one had actually crossed there before, so it would be impossible. So they didn't think to look for us on the other side, but we had already crossed it. And so, fortunately, the helicopter turned around and it showed up. It was an ancient Russian-built helicopter. It was just basically a glass dome, a gas tank, and an engine with a propeller on it. Um, they were very, very excited to rescue us, and we were very excited to receive some water. Um, they, they brought us out. Um, in camp, we had a medic, so I ended up getting uh, hooked up to an IV. Um, 20 minutes later, after being dehydrated for two days, you feel great. Um, we were all ready. The next day, we decided to go back out and see if we could continue with the expedition. And we ended up discovering one of the largest caves in Madagascar, lots of different lemur species, some archaeological artifacts, and that dinosaur migration route I was talking about before. Here's the cave that we discovered. It ended up being one of the largest caves in Madagascar. It was over a mile long, so it's almost two kilometers long. It was incredible. And so here's a quick little video. Oh, I think I see a hand somewhere. Is there a hand? Someone have a question before we continue on? No? No, that might have just been me taking a screenshot. OK, no problem. Um, I'm going to play a quick little clip. This is from Discovery Channel up in Canada that shows um, it's five minutes about what we did in that in the in the scene in the expedition there. So here we go. <laughs> That's an obstacle course. There are a few places left on this earth that have yet to be explored, and that's just how the adventure science team likes it. Here we are on our drive into camp. Going eight kilometers, another 12k to go. Yeah, they're an unusual team built on the idea that extreme athletes working with yeah. scientists can cover more ground and make more discoveries. 
our approach is is quite novel in that we're comparing athletes and science, and that we're trying to use those those field skills to achieve academic ends. They come to Madagascar to survey the wildlife, explore cave systems, and do a little paleontology along the way. So we've been battling through uh, density forests, stepping over thrice, and razor sharp limestone features. There's definitely a reason why people don't do research. You know? We just did our first science stop at this uh, really cool singio crop here. Basically, it's about 10 meters high, and it's got numerous uh, channels cut through it. For both scientists and athletes, there is real danger with every step. Is there a way through? So we're navigating a herring right now to kind of pop through this forest and this little labyrinth. We can get down a bit, and we can see that there's a portal heading down, and we can push through this. Holy smokes! Yeah, I wouldn't mind having those knee pads right about now. It's a real grind, but it doesn't take long before the team makes their first discovery. They found our first uh, cultural artifact. They found a, uh, a wide rim pot. There's just really a general absence of cultural material from the earliest inhabitants of Madagascar. And the significance of this is huge. This is the first cultural find in this region. For a team with lots of fruit, it's a great start. One that leads them straight to the underworld. Let's see how far this goes. I have no idea. Can you give this? By far, this is the largest new cave system that I've ever explored. Looks like we found a um, cave leech. I mean, so it's got a flat head on the front there. It's looking for somewhere to attach itself. Maybe get a little meal. This place is amazing. There are rooms with spokes going off in every direction. Each one of them leads to another incredible passageway. A few explorers stay behind to map the cave. There is more work to be done topside. The smaller group heads out in search of something completely different. Uh, we just got dropped off uh, from base camp here. We're headed into the east portion of the city forest. Uh, with dinosaur tracks. Finding dinosaur tracks is extremely rare. A recent ground survey and satellite images it's... suggest this area could be hiding from paleo gold. Oh yeah, that's an exciting part. A reptile for sure, but not quite a dinosaur. And a long trek, but eventually they hit a Jurassic jackpot. Which is consistent with the theropods, or the predatory bipedal dinosaur. Pretty eroded, but you can still see the distinctive inner toe and the side toe. After a grueling 14 days, covering 70 kilometers of the toughest terrain, the adventure science team can head home with nothing left to prove. Everything we That was a that was a lot of fun working with the adventure science team. Simon Donato, he was the one who started that. He was the one who you saw talking in the video about the water. Um, and it was fantastic. We, we discovered everything we wanted to discover, and we got to see a remote part of Madagascar that very few people get to go visit. So that was really cool. And normally when I talk about Madagascar, I talk about lemurs. And many of you may, be, may even know this particular lemur. His name um, used to be a TV show about him called Zabumafu. And before I get into the lemurs, I'm going to talk to you guys about another group of animals insects. This tiny little leaf is only a few centimeters or a couple inches across and on it are some eggs. They look like tiny bits of popcorn. When they hatch they form into an insect called a leaf planted insect. And if you look at this insect you'll think oh it just looks like some moss or a flower or something like that. Well it's actually a group of insects together. And what's really incredible about it is that it eats a nectar from the tree and it stays in one place, and it excretes or it poops a waxy substance 
that lemurs actually eat. The lemurs eat the poo of this insect. Pretty outrageous. Here's what the insect looks like up close. Looks like a Martian with a, a shredded wedding dress. It's outrageous. And if you think that's incredible, um, look at the back of it. Those little bits there, those are meant to protect it from predators. And so if they get bit, they get a mouthful of sticky, fuzzy, bitter stuff. Well, I'm brave. Um, I was the one that was going into that water in the cave. I wanted to see where that uh, area went. But when it came to trying the insect poo, I was not going to do it. Fortunately, my friend was brave, so he tried it. And he said it was sweet, but had a bitter finish. I asked him if he'd try it again. He said no. But we found out it did have sugars in it. And that's what the lemurs are going for. So the lemurs like to eat it. Well, a lot like a caterpillar that turns into a butterfly, this organism turns into a beautiful leaf bug. So what you're looking at now is the juvenile stage. Here's the adult form here. You can even still see the white fuzz on it. And this is what they look like together with their wings out. This is what they call a leaf flatted insect. Pretty incredible. Well, I thought that was amazing, but I think the next one's even more incredible. It's what they call a web throwing spider. So in Madagascar, they have their own version of Spider-Man. So instead of making a web that it just spreads across two branches, this spider will actually make a beautiful, intricate net. And it'll actually pull the net really tight close to its body. And when some insect flies past, it'll throw the web at it, catch it, and reel it in, just like a fisherman. It's called a web-throwing spider. So now we've seen a leaf-flatted insect. We've seen a web-throwing spider. What other weird things does Madagascar have? Here is Rat necked beetle. This outrageous beetle has um, a really, really long neck that the, that uh, that's usually only in males. Females typically have short necks, and the males use it to show off. They want to show how big and strong they are to other females. So they have these really, really big necks, but the animal itself is tiny. It's only about half an inch or about a centimeter tall. It's very, very small. Well, the next one I want to show you is a short little video of a lizard in Madagascar. And I'm going to see if you guys can find it in the video. I'm going to play the video now. Okay, here, here's the video. See if you can find this lizard that's in this video. One more try. Here we go. Mark, here's spot of the leaf tail gecko. It's one of the hardest species to find in Madagascar. It took me almost 10 minutes before I saw it. Amazing creature. Perfectly blends in with the surroundings. It's one of the most cryptic animals one of the most cryptic animals in the world. And it's one of the neat things that you can come see in this No wonder they call it the deep wonder of the world. Okay, I want to see a show of hands. Who knows how many of you have seen this lizard before? Uh, a couple, a few of you, okay. So let's see if we can see you again. Here's a, here's a photo. Um, I hope you can see my... Um, this thing. Yeah, so if you look at, here's my chin. If you look past my chin, that's the nose of the gecko here. There's the head. That's the front foot. Here's the belly. There's the back feet. So that's the gecko there. Oh, this gecko is not even crying. If this gecko wanted to be, um, to be invisible, it would press its body even closer to the tree, and you wouldn't see this black line that you see here. That's because it's lifting its body up a bit. And they're called leaf-tailed geckos, and here's what that species looks like up close. Really incredible species. I love leaf-tailed geckos. They're amazing. I'm going to resize this again. That might be better for you guys to see. So that's the leaf-tailed gecko. Here's another one called the satanic leaf-tailed gecko. Because of the horns it has above its eyes. Instead of blending in with the bark, this one acts like a dead leaf. You can see it in the photo because I used my flash. But if I didn't have the flash, it would just look like another dead leaf on the tree. But besides um, these cool lizards and the different bugs I showed you, Madagascar is home to the majority of the world's chameleon. Here is a Parsons chameleon found in the rainforest of Madagascar. 
Now, maybe I could get, um, hopefully I can hear you, but maybe one of you can tell me what makes chameleon special. I can't hear you. Yeah, I heard probably not the right thing. Let's call it one from Mr. Cameron's class, and then I'll do one from uh, Mrs. Wisniewski's. You have to write it on the whiteboard. Well, let's just come up and uh, tell you what we're thinking. Hi. And if you're trying to spell camouflage, just write camo. Are you ready? Yeah, ready. Nice look. They can change color. Yes, exactly. Now, from uh, Mrs. Wesneski's class, we got one says they can change color. What else can chameleons do that's special? Their tongue. Their tongue. Their tongue. Yes, their tongue. Nobody knows that. Yeah, fantastic. And so we've got their tongue. They can uh, they can change color, and I overheard someone say they can move their eyes in different directions. Well, if you look at some of these photos, here's another one with eyes pointed backwards. This is a rhinoceros chameleon. This one here is the world's smallest chameleon and the world's smallest lizard. They discovered it in 2012. So the bottom right one is a full-grown adult sitting on a matchstick. Isn't that incredible? I absolutely love this next one because it has the biggest schnoz in the in the in the chameleon world. Look at that nose. Nose is used to attract uh, mates, so it's a fantastic, fantastic-looking creature. Now, someone mentioned the um, their uh, ability to use their tongues. Well, let's see if we can uh, play that now. Slow motion, whack! Isn't that amazing? Yeah, I think that's worth seeing again. Let's watch that one more time. Oops. One more time. Gets his tongue ready, finds the insect, whack! There he goes. It took us a long time to get that image. We had to feed that chameleon a lot of grasshoppers. So there's 150 different species of chameleon in Madagascar. Now, another thing that's special about Madagascar is their birds. There's 400 species of birds, and 200 of them are only found in Madagascar, including this one, which has some amazing Lady Gaga eyeshadow on. This is called a crested kua. Yeah, in Madagascar, you have the straight horse footy. But I'll leave on the class there, I announcement. Um, if you guys can wave that you can still hear me. Yeah, looks like you can all hear me. Great. So on the top left here, we had a forest foodie. We have a malachite kingfisher. We also have a sickle-billed vanga and another bird called a Madagascar fish eagle, which is a lot like the American bald eagle, but this one is unique to Madagascar. So we've seen some amazing animals, but we all know that the reason most people think of Madagascar is lemurs. So lemurs are just outrageous. And there's over 100 species of lemur found in Madagascar, and all of them are only found in Madagascar. You can't find lemurs anywhere else naturally. This one here is called a black and white rough lemur, and it's looking inside my camera to see if I have any bananas. Now, I didn't have any bananas, so it was a little upset with me. But in a different part of the country, you can go see ringtail lemurs, which are also well known. Um, there's a fantastic show called Lemur Street, which you can learn about ringtail lemurs, and they occur in the southern part of Madagascar. What's really cool about them is they have the ability to use um, a scent gland to cover their tail with a scent, and they actually have stink fights. So they'll throw their tail in the air towards another individual, and throwing the scent at them, and the and the individual with the stronger scent will win the fight. So it's called uh, a ringtail lemur. Now, there's also these tiny little guys called mouse lemurs. They're the smallest lemur in Madagascar and also the smallest primate in the world. If you look at that bottom left photo here, you'll see this mouse lemur. This is a golden brown mouse lemur sitting beside some bananas. Well, those are those small bananas that you 
sometimes see in tropical countries. It's actually a very, very small individual. It's about the size of an egg. And what they do is they bounce around the forest at night looking for sugar or fruits. Um, sugar they'll get from nectar, uh, nectar from trees or from those insects I talked about. And they're like watching a kid at Halloween. They bounce through the forest like a ping pong ball going down a set of stairs. And they're really cool. I study them quite often in Madagascar. The next one uh, my friend describes as a furry little Yoda. And this little guy, he lives in tree holes during the day but comes out at night. So it's a nocturnal species, which, si which is why it has really, really large eyes. And it'll jump around the trees looking for fruits and leaves. And during the day, it hides in tree holes. And when it gets scared, it sinks down in the tree hole so that no one can find it. So it's hidden there. One of the big predators of lemurs is going to be what's called a fusa. It's a, it's a mongoose-like cat thing. Uh, you might have seen it from the movie Madagascar. Um, they also snakes eat lemurs and as well as different birds. And so they have to hide in tree holes during the day when they're, um, when they're um, exposed. Well, after this guy, this one's pretty cool. This one's a brown lemur. It's the most important lemur in Madagascar because of the amount of seed dispersal it does. So what it does is it actually consumes lots of different fruits, and when it goes um, to a different part of the forest, it eventually will swallow those fruits, it'll digest them, and eventually has to go to the bathroom. And when it does, it'll deposit the seeds of the fruits in a new location. That's called seed dispersal. It's very important for forests, and this species disperses more seed types than any other species in Madagascar. The next one is pretty cool because it's probably the cutest lemur in Madagascar, and it's called... The, gr the common gray bamboo lemur. And just like panda bears, this lemur only eats bamboo. And it specializes in eating a very toxic part of the bamboo that's filled with cyanide. And so what would actually make you and I very sick, this lemur can tolerate. And actually you can digest different levels of cyanide. So it's really, really incredible. And, it's, and that's all it eats is just high cyanide-rich bamboo but they're adorable. Very, very cute lemur. The next lemur is the one I showed you at the beginning. That was the um, Zabumafu. They also called a Cockerel Shafaka. And that's because the, the sound they make when they're, when they're disruptive, or disrupted by somebody or something, they'll go, Shafaka, Shafaka. That's the sound they make. And they can actually jump almost 8 meters. That's over 20-some feet from tree to tree. Now, that's incredible. But what's even more incredible is the next one. This one's the largest lemur in Madagascar, and it can jump 10 meters, so that's 30 feet from one tree to the next. And it's also the loudest lemur in Madagascar. The word lemur actually means spirits of the dead. And when the first explorers arrived in Madagascar, they were terrified to hear the sounds that came out of the forest, and they never wanted to go inside the forest until eventually someone did, and they ended up seeing the small mouse lemurs, and they saw the bamboo lemurs, and they realized there was nothing to fear, but the sound was so scary. Well, this one I'm going to play another video, and this is the loudest lemur in Madagascar. I'll play it for you now. So that's an injury. To me, they look like a, a four-year-old wearing a panda suit um, with a trumpet stuck in his throat. They're really incredible lemurs, and I think they're really cool. So that's all the lemurs I'm going to talk about now. Um, what I'm going to talk about next is sort of the, the issues facing lemurs in Madagascar, so the plight of, of Madagascar. So you can see on the left here, there's a lady. She's um, getting some rice prepared. She's getting ready to feed her family. In the top right, you'll see some burning. In the bottom, there's some people who are raising some cattle. And in Madagascar, there's 22 million people, um, and they're just trying to make a living. They're trying to um, help their families, help their neighbors. And so to do that, they grow rice and they raise cattle. Well, the problem is they burn forest and they burn grassland to do that. 
what ends up happening is areas that were once covered in forests end up beginning turning into grassland. And if you repeatedly burn the same areas over and over, the grassland takes over. And so that's typically what they'll do. They'll burn this area again. The green shoots will grow back. The cattle will come and graze that. Um, and then they'll do it again the next year. But then the rainy season comes. You can see this small crack here along the photo. Well, what happens is that crack will grow and grow and grow. In just a few short years, maybe 100, 200 years, it'll go from a small 10-foot wide chasm to a massive canyon. And so that's a big problem because there's no forest left here. This is not good land for cattle, and it's bad for growing crops. They think that maybe the bottom in here might be some good soil so they can grow um, different vegetables and rice inside there. But the rest of this, this is inorganic. This is too difficult to grow back. And so it's really difficult to see this because this is not a place that lemurs can live. But I mentioned it's, there's a problem in Madagascar, and the people there are poor. So if you look at this map, you'll see there's a few countries that are doing quite well. The countries in blue make quite a bit of money. These are the wealthier countries. Of course, that's where we live in Canada and the U.S. But the ones that are dark brown, see a few in sub-Saharan Africa, and then there's one in southern Asia. They are the poorest countries in the world. And in Madagascar, people live, most of them live on less than $2 a day. That's not much money. But what really bothers me and the number that bothers me the most is that 40% of children are malnourished. So after years of living in Madagascar and working with people there and trying to uh, research lemurs, I decided, well, something has to be done about this. We have to protect lemurs and help people. You can't do one without the other. And so I created a small nonprofit called uh, Planet Madagascar where we work with communities on innovative solutions to help them help themselves so they can help me conserve lemurs in Madagascar. And we're taking data that I learned from my research and other uh, projects and trying to find effective solutions. So the photos here, you can see at the bottom that was at the beginning. This was just taken uh, uh, two weeks ago. We now have um, 22 staff in Madagascar who are helping us uh, build fire breaks and protect forests. We started off with just a few of us, like I mentioned, working. This is at the end of my project. I got together with the person on the on the left. He was the chief of the village. Um, this gentleman here, Mommy, he his um, that's his name is Mommy. He runs um, the organization on the ground, and these are two villagers that are from the communities that we work with. So we started this organization. I went to the southern part of Madagascar so I can get some training. Um, basic things like latrines. They don't have latrines in Madagascar. A lot of people just go to the bathroom wherever they can. There's no toilets. Um, there's no running water. There's no electricity. So I was learning about all these basics that we try to help, um, help them get in different villages. Uh, I did an education project called Lambas for Lemurs. Lambas are a type of cloth that, that people in Madagascar are wear. You can see um, in the photo, a few people have them on. There's one lady with an orange lamba here. Um, that's just basically um, like a sarong or sari, and both men and women will wear it, and often there'll be some sort of proverb on it. Um, it might say something like, plant your rice early, don't kiss your cousin, you know, things like that. Well, we decided to put a proverb on it that said, a healthy forest has lemurs, and that's what it says on the bottom of our lamba. And the idea was to promote um, a sense of pride in lemurs and get people excited about lemurs, and also to explain how lemurs were important because they were major seed dispersers of the forest. Um, the one thing that we don't we take for granted is that to us lemurs are cool and they're really interesting, but to them they're more like raccoons or squirrels. They don't actually um, see them as being something special, and so teaching them about how they're only found in Madagascar um, got them really excited because they were really proud of the fact that they were the only people in the world that had lemurs. So that was a cool project we did. We worked with lots of school kids. We're doing projects on, on lemurs and teaching them about conservation and the environment. They don't have a classroom where they are, so we everything's taught outside underneath a tree if it's raining. And then we did the Good Forest Project called Atiala Salama, where we just finished cutting four miles or six kilometers of fire breaks. That's this red line here where we cut these fire breaks to protect fires from damaging forests. Um, that allowed us to get 21 people hired so they had jobs and they were able to feed their families with that money. 
and then we put up signs to sort of promote this project so other villagers could see where they should burn their where they should burn for their for their cattle. So that was a really successful project that we're continuing next year. And it's going on right now as we speak. They're actually building more fire breaks. Um, and then we made a conservation education film. And I wanted to show you our um, Indiegogo campaign video um, just to give you a sense of some of the cool stuff going on with our projects, but also so you can see um, the kind of footage we're getting in Madagascar and so you can get excited about lemurs and you learn a little bit about them. So I'll play that for you now. Madagascar is home to over 100 species of lemur. These unique species are only found on this island. Sadly, over 90% of lemurs are threatened with extinction. They are the most endangered mammal group in the world. Our objective is to help lemurs and their habitat. Fire is the biggest threat to tropical deciduous forests in Madagascar. Within Ankara Fonts National Park, local residents are allowed to burn savanna areas to graze their cattle. The problem is that this burning can accidentally catch the tropical forest on fire, damaging lemur habitat and affecting people's livelihood. We plan to create a documentary to help educate people in Madagascar about the issues facing lemurs, forests, and the local residents who live in the national park. We need your help to make this possible. With your donation, together we can make a difference, helping save lemurs, their habitat, and improving the lives of local communities through education and employment. So that was the film that we made um, uh, just a few months ago to generate funds for our project. Um, but it's a good segue because there's, there's something you guys can do to help us out, to help our projects in Madagascar. And it's quite easy. Um, if you want, you can uh, like us on Facebook. You can spread the word of our project on social media and Twitter, both Facebook and Twitter. Um, and if you want to get people excited about the project and you want to share with them that video that I just shared with you, you can show them that, um, that campaign link there at the bottom there. And if you share, the more people you share it with, the higher we rank on Indiegogo's site, and the more um, exposure we get, the more likely we are to get donations from other people. Um, but a big thing is just following us on uh, Facebook. If you want to do that, we're always sharing cool stuff about um, Madagascar and lemurs and exciting news. Um, so lots of fun stuff like that. Um, to do what I do in, in Madagascar and to do the conservation work we do there, we're supported by lots and lots of different organizations. So these are organizations from around Canada, the US, uh, Great Britain, and uh, Madagascar. So it's a really important to get a lot of relationships to help uh, us succeed in our goals. Um, now, that's the end of my talk. I want to thank you all. Um, but I think we have some time for some questions, because we have about 10 more minutes. So I'd love to take some questions. That's number two, please. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. I see in the, uh, I can definitely hear Mr. Cameron's class, and I think I can hear um, Mrs. Uh, Wisniewski's class as well. But I saw you had a board there in, in Mrs. Wisniewski's class, so we'll do maybe a question um, uh, from one class, and we'll do the next class, and we'll go back again. So let's start. Um, again, with Mr. Cameron's class, um, if you have a question, I'll be happy to, to answer it for you. Nice. OK. We have a student coming up to the uh, camera. Great. By the way, thank you so much for your presentation and uh, just giving us a, a glimpse of what you do in Madagascar. I think, well, we think what you're doing is fantastic. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to stop my screen share so you can see my face. There we go. Hi. Hi. What inspired you to become a primatologist? 
Ooh, that's a very good question. So I was a little bit younger than you guys. I was eight years old, and I was sitting in a tree with my best friend, and he wanted to, we asked each other where we wanted to be when we grew up. Now, he wanted to own a skateboard shop. We were, we liked skateboarding, so he wanted to own a skateboard shop. And he asked me, and he was a little older than me, and I, and I said, I want to be a monkey. That's what I want to be when I grow up. And being smarter than me and older than me, he said, well, that's not possible. So I said, fine, then I want to study monkeys. And so fortunately, the university that I went to was the same university that, um, uh, that I, uh, was in the same city that I grew up in. And they actually had a program um, in primatology. So it's a Bachelor of Science of Primatology. And so I was taking the first course, and I met a gentleman named um, Brian Keating. And he's, he's, he's well known out west in Canada. He, has, uh, he used to be on Discovery Channel quite a bit. And he was showing me pictures of lemurs and, and orangutans and chimpanzees. And I was 17 years old, and it blew my mind. I thought, these things are incredible. And I found out they didn't have Google back then. Uh, the Internet was barely a thing. But uh, I did find him online, and I noticed that he led trips to places like Madagascar. And I saw he was leading a trip to a country called Guyana in South America. I'd never been there. I was 17, hadn't really traveled much. And he said to me, uh, well, I, I came up to him and I said, I'd love to go on this trip, but it's $7,000. I don't have $7,000. You got to remember, I'm, I'm paying my own way to university. I'm 17 years old, trying to buy food and go to university. And he looks at me and he said, if you give me $50 next class and you promise that one day you'll, you'll pay off this trip, I'll let you come. So I ended up going to Guyana when I was 18, um, getting to see uh, capuchin monkeys and howler monkeys and white-faced sackies, and it blew my mind. I paid off every dime. I gave him $100 a week for, for two years, <laughs> paid off $7,000, went and brought a camera, and I knew after seeing monkeys in the wild that that's what I wanted to do. So it was a question of figuring out how to do it. So I took some biology classes, this primatology degree. Um, I do a lot of statistics now, so I have to remember my math. So if you need math, um, you, uh, if you want to study monkeys, you're going to need math. Um, so that's how, that's how I came to be a primatologist. Thank you. Welcome. Hannah. Okay, from the other class. Did you want to come up to the microphone, or do you want to hold? Um... Come on, Hannah. I'm not sure if you can hear us yet or not. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, perfect. Then just come on up and ask. Come on up. Do lemurs live in trees? Um, and if they don't, where do they live? That's a very good question. The question is, do lemurs live in trees? And if they uh, don't, where do they live? Well. There are 103 different species, and almost every single one is, is arboreal, so what meaning living in the trees. Um, the exception would be the ring-tailed lemur. It spends uh, a lot of its time, in fact, most of its time on the ground, um, and then the rest are in trees, from the very small ones all the way to the big ones. Some of them never come to the ground. Some come sometimes. Um, but almost all of them are what we call arboreal. So it's about 100, 102 species that are arboreal, or one we consider terrestrial, even though if it wants, it can go in trees very easily. Um, it just spends its time mostly on the ground. Um, back to Mr. Cameron's class, another question? He's on his way. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jesse, and I was wondering, why do the lemurs only live in Madagascar? Ah, so there's another good question. Why do the lemurs only live in Madagascar? Well, Madagascar separated from uh, the continent of Africa around 85 million years ago. Um, and if you knew anything about primate evolution, we you know that most of the earliest primates that we've discovered in the in the fossil record go back to about 50 million years ago. Um, so there's this gap between when the island was there and when primates existed. So all of a sudden, um, 30 some million years after Madagascar separated from Africa, um, you suddenly see primates, you see lemurs. And so the question is, how could they get there? The island is now hundreds of kilometers away from Africa. 
how could they come to uh, Madagascar from Africa, where, where, where the primates were existing at the time? Um, and they think uh, that they actually rafted over. Now, this doesn't mean that they created their own raft. This means that they very likely were swept away by a large storm. There's very, very large um, uh, hurricanes, they call them cyclones over there, that will hit the west, uh, eastern coast of Africa. And if it's a large enough uh, storm surge, it can actually drag big chunks of forest out to sea. And lemurs are special compared to the rest of the primates. They have uh, very low metabolic rates, which made, would have made them very suitable for surviving a sort of long-distance rafting trip across the ocean. Now, it's pretty outrageous to think about it, but all it would have to have taken was one time with, an indi uh, with at least one female and one male. And it's possible it happened more than once. They think genetic evidence suggested that um, it only happened one time. And then the way the currents worked, it didn't allow them to go back in the other direction. Um, so that's why there's only lemurs in Madagascar. Now there's another group of, of primates, they're called, which lemurs belong to. They're called strepsorines, or what they call wet-nosed primates. We have a dry nose, like monkeys and apes, but some of them have a wet nose. These are going to be galagos, um, lorises, and lemurs. Now those exist, the galagos, uh, which are also called bush babies, exist in Africa and Asia. So they're similar to lemurs, but they're, they're different. They've sort of had separate evolution for almost 50 million years. So they, they've, they've they solved similar problems, but they do it a little bit differently. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, why are lemurs endangered other than fires? That's also another good question. Why are lemurs endangered other than fire? Well, Madagascar, I said, is a massive island. Um, people arrived there about 2,000 years ago. Um, typically, when people arrive on islands, what we do is we cut down, burn down forests, and we hunt. That's what, usually what people do from, uh, um, from the beginnings of arrivals on islands. And so most islands have lost their unique species around the world. But because Madagascar is big, it still holds on to some of the species. Um, so the main thing in, in the west where I work is going to be fire. Fire is destroying forests. In some places, people will actually hunt and eat lemurs. Um, and so they're losing uh, some of the species due to hunting. Um, in other areas, it's due to just cutting the forest. Um, in other areas, it's due to um, sort of industrial production, like mines and things like that. But the main reason is just hunting, cutting, and burning of forests. And since we talk about almost every lemur needs forest, um, it's, it's, uh, if there's no forest, there's no lemurs. And we know for sure that they've lost 50% of their forest since the 1950s. And, so, um, and some estimate they've lost even more than that. The forest that I work in is in the west. Some estimate that there's only 3% of that forest left. Um, I can't confirm that, but um, I know there's very, very little. So. Without forests, there's no lemur. So the big trick is protecting forests. But people need forests, so you have to find solutions for people as well. Thank you. Welcome. One more question, Travis? Sure. Okay. Hi, I'm Cooper, and I was wondering Hi. how do forests catch on fire in Madagascar? The question is, how do forests catch on fire in Madagascar? That's a, also a good question. And so um, some of the forest fires are natural. And so in the very, very dry areas, at the end of the dry season, it's, it's, it's been dry for almost nine months. So think of somewhere like California where they've had a massive drought. Well, a storm could come through and there could be a lightning bolt and could strike the ground. That can cause a fire. Sometimes just static electricity from when the wind blows through the grasses can cause a, uh, a fire. Um, so there can be natural causes, and that's that's totally normal for that to happen in, in, in grassland um, in Madagascar. Um, but it's it's very likely that a lot of the fires are also started by people. And so in the area that I work, they will walk through um, grassland like I showed you pictures of before, and they'll light it on fire. And they'll come back two weeks later because the grass starts to regrow. When it regrows, it's green, and that's healthier for the cattle. And so they bring their cattle back there. So they burn it um, to, to graze their cattle. 
they don't mean to burn the forest. The forest just happens to be near the grass, so it catches on fire. It's a dry forest, so it's easily burnt. Um, in some areas, uh, I know in the in the south and east parts of the country, they'll actually burn the forest directly so that they can they can um, plant more crops, so they can plant more agriculture. So it's mostly people, but there can be um, natural causes too. And sometimes, some years, the natural causes are are happen more often than people actually burning. Thank you. Welcome. Well, guys, that was that was exciting. I don't know if there's any more questions, but if you do, um, I can uh, I can stop the broadcast. I have a few more minutes for for those that want to ask. But I want to thank uh, Exploring by the Seat of Their Pants for setting this up, um, and then uh, Mr. Cameron's class up in is it Thunder Bay? It, it yeah. is Thunder Bay. Yeah, wonderful up in Thunder Bay and. Uh, uh, also, Mrs. Wasneski, and I think there's two. Um, we got two classes together there. We also got um, uh, Mr. Sackets as well together. So I want to thank you guys all for taking the time to hear me. Uh, I'm going to stop the broadcast now, but I'm available for another ten minutes.